Well, this past week, we observed a commemoration of sorts. The left media went berserk about January the 6th. And, and I thought it would be important for just a moment if we, we would focus on that for just a second. You know, what, what we saw on January the 6th troubled many of us. Now, I think it's unfair to say that Donald Trump did this because actually he told them in the speech, if you've listened to the speech, to go down to the Capitol and peacefully and respectfully petition your congressmen and women because that vote to certify the electors was coming up. And I think all of us believe that there was a lot of cheating and hanky-panky that went on in that whole deal. Even one of our own senators, Senator Lankford, had said that it appeared to him there was definite proof that there was fraud in the election, and then he folded up like a cheap suit and voted to seat the electors, which just <laughs> infuriates me. Well, I, over the years, I've led a lot of tours to D.C. and to Gettysburg and places in that part of the country, and every time that we're there, I always respect the Capitol building and the grounds, not necessarily because who the president is at the time or who's in Congress, but because of what those things represent. I mean, I've led tours into the basement of the Capitol called a crypt where part of Statuary Hall is located. The other half is up in the old house uh, chamber. But down in the crypt, and it's called that because that's where Washington originally, they had intended to bury him, but he wanted to be buried at Mount Vernon. So that's where he is. But uh, Peter Muhlenberg, the Black Robe Regiment guy, his statue is, is in the basement. And we've always respected the building. And some of these things that happened on the 6th, I have to say, really... Uh, turn my stomach, just to be honest. I mean, look at this idiot uh, wearing these horns. And that guy even got into the Senate chamber, and that's him standing behind the pro Tim's desk. I, out of all the tours that I've ever led to D.C., I've only been in the Senate chamber one time. I'm talking about down on the floor. And so, so some of this stuff, uh, i got to be honest with you, is, is just revolting to me. Now, I know these do not speak for the vast majority of people who were at that rally. But, I mean, you know, you, you might debate whether or not someone ought to be flying the, the southern flag. But to be carrying it through the Capitol like that, I mean, that's, that's just utterly ridiculous. Or even though this is a grainy photograph... This dude sitting in Nancy Pelosi's desk, I mean, what could he possibly catch by, by sitting there in, in I mean, I, I don't know that I'd want to, I mean, but seriously, you think about it, that, that, that's, that's very disrespectful, and regardless of what you think about Nancy Pelosi or whoever the Speaker of the House is, Americans should, should not be doing that. I've led tours in the rotunda, that's where this is, and I've gone around that rotunda with, and, and told the stories of those massive paintings that you can see there to the left as the uh, uh, surrender of Burgoyne at, uh, at Saratoga. But look at this fruitcake uh, walking around with one of the official podiums uh, there in the Capitol. I mean, it's people like this that give the rest of us a really bad name. And, and then, of course, it ultimately ended in some pretty horrific violence. Uh, there were people who were breaking windows. As you can see, these windows have been broken from the other side because there's the glass on that counter. But the, uh, the Capitol Police, I think, were mostly trying to do their job. Now, I know there are mixed stories about some of them standing there, taking the tape down and allowing people to go in and all that. But I can tell you, every time I've ever led a tour at the Capitol, man, you are under the strictest of, of watch and care, and you have to be there by permission. So I don't know exactly what happened, and I don't want to, to, to vilify. I do believe that the people that they've arrested, over 600 of them, many of them are still in solitary confinement since January the 6th of last. That's ridiculous that they're being deprived of their constitutional rights. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea that, that I think all of them are crooks or criminals. I mean, there was one person killed, uh, 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 a lady who was there, who that is a, a tragedy. But this week, the left media tried to tell us that that's the worst thing that's ever happened in America, the worst thing that's ever happened at the Capitol, the greatest threat to our republic. So I thought for just a second before we get into the message, you might be interested in just a little bit of history. In 1783, now this is at the close of the War of Independence, 400 veterans of the war... 
themselves still soldiers in the colonial army, actually stormed the Capitol at that time was the State House in Philadelphia, which also houses Independence Hall and all, demanding back pay. They blocked the doors and wouldn't allow the uh, delegates to leave, and they were terrified inside. Eventually, the delegates were able to flee, wash, uh, flee Philadelphia, and that's part of the reason why the District of Columbia was eventually created. It's not all of the reason, but, but that was in 1783, and these are veterans of the War of Independence. That's actually more violent than January the 6th. But then, of course, if you know your history, you know in the War of 1812, in, uh, in 1814, on August the 24th, the British actually burned the Capitol, what we would call the White House. They called it at that time the President's Mansion and other landmarks leaving the Capitol in ruins. I definitely would say that one was worse than January the 6th. What about this? On June the, the 2nd, 1915, a former German professor at Harvard University, Eric Mutner, I guess is his name, blew up the Senate's reception room using three sticks of dynamite. Now, by the way, all of those on January the 6th, not a one of them had a firearm. Okay, so no firearms. The only firearms that were used were ones by the Capitol Police. But that is far more violent. Or how about in the summer of 1932, when some 25,000 World War I veterans gathered outside Congress demanding a salary bonus. When Congress did not pass that bonus, many of them set up a camp right there on Capitol Hill, and the legislators were so fearful of this group that eventually, I bet you've never heard about this, armed federal troops led by General Douglas MacArthur, you'll recognize these names, Major at that time, Dwight Eisenhower and George Patton torched and gassed the veterans' camps, killing several and wounding many. Did any of you hear about that from the left media this week? I didn't hear about any of that from the, uh, from the left media. Or what about this date, March the 1st, 1954, when four Puerto Rican nationalists stormed the U.S. House floor armed with handguns, which none of the ones on January the 6th were, shot indiscriminately into the House, wounding five congressmen. Did you hear that on CNN this week? Uh, probably not. Or how about in the early 70s when a group called the Weather Underground planted a series of explosives around Washington, D.C., successfully bombing the U.S. Capitol building and the Pentagon? Did any of you hear that? by the left media. Oh, and by the way, they were led by this man. This is Bill Ayers, uh, a close friend of Barack Obama, who Barack Obama said helped him to get his political uh, 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 career going and is his mentor. So these, this underground uh, uh, weather or weather underground group was led by Barack Obama's good friend. Bet you didn't hear about that on the news this week either. Or how about on November the 7th, 1983, uh, by, while protesting U.S. military actions in Grenada and Lebanon, a group called the Armed Resistance Unit detonated a bomb in the Capitol's north wing just outside of the chamber of the U.S. Senate, causing $250,000 worth of damages. Did anybody hear about that on the news this week? No, probably not. Or how about on July the 24th, 1998, when this man, Russell Eugene Weston Jr., broke past security ran toward the office of then Majority Whip Representative Tom DeLay, killing two Capitol Police officers. The one on the left is Officer Jacob Chestnut Jr., and the one on the right is Detective John Gibson, and he also wounded a tourist. Did anybody hear about that this week when they were talking about the horrific January the 6th? Or what about 9-11? Uh, what about the attacks on the Pentagon and we know that the plane ditched in Pennsylvania was probably headed to the Capitol or to the White House. Uh, did anybody talk about that? Do you remember the anthrax uh, threats and attacks that occurred a few days after 9-11 right there in the Capitol as some congressmen were opening up envelopes that uh, either had anthrax or at least appeared to have anthrax and all that. I bet that wasn't mentioned this week when they were talking about January the 6th. And then they had the audacity to say that January the 6th was the greatest threat to our republic and the darkest day in American history. What about that day? 
What about December the 7th, 1941, when uh, 2,335 military personnel and 68 civilians were killed with the Japanese attack on America? How about that? Or how about this being a fairly dark day, 9-11, when 2,977 American civilians or citizens were killed and another 6,000 plus were injured. So I think it's always important in this world that we live in to keep things in a proper perspective because our news, even sometimes places like Fox, do not tell us the whole story. And so we have a responsibility then to do our homework and even though we're not all historians, uh, many of us may not even enjoy history, it's important that we know our history. Because number one, if we don't know it, we'll probably repeat the same stupid cycle over and over and over. And secondly, when we're being lied to, even by not being told all of the truth, we'll know it. So I thought this was very important that we mentioned this this morning, and I hope that that helps to put January the 6th, as much as we detest what happened on that day, um, it kind of helps to put it in a little better perspective based upon our history. All right, well, I want to shift gears here and for the next few moments talk to you about the value of vision. The value of vision. Now, we're not talking about your physical eyesight. It's pretty important. It's a wonderful gift. When was the last time you thanked God that you could see? Well, I can tell you those who have lost their sight wish that they had their sight every day. It's a gift that we have that we often take for granted. When was the last time that you thanked God for the fact you can hear? Now, there's sometimes, maybe I'd like to dial that hearing back every, every, every now and then, but when was the last time you thanked God that you could hear? Or when was the last time that you thanked God that you could feel? And you, you could know when you're touching. We have a lot of gifts that God has giving a, given us that we kind of take for granted, don't we? Well, the vision I'm talking about here, though, is not your physical eyesight, although that is a tremendous gift and incredibly valuable. Now, what I'm talking about is spiritual insight. Vision is critical. Now, we just entered a new year. We're just a few days into 2022, if you can believe it. How many of you remember when you used to try to sit and figure out how old you'd be when it turned 2000? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you remember that? See, I used to sit and think, how old will I be? Well, I'll be an old man when 2000. How many of you remember when they told us about a year before 2000 came along in Y2K that that day you're going to get up and go downstairs to make your coffee and your toaster was going to assault you, or you were going to get in your car or you're going to get in your car and it's going to hijack you and take you to Cuba. I mean, you guys remember where they told us all this stuff was going to go haywire? None of it happened. We are 22 years past that. Can you believe that? I mean, you can always tell when you're getting older because you're always saying, I can't believe that. I mean, you're always, wow, you know how time flies. 22 years ago, it turned 2000. I used to think I'd be an old man when it turned 2000. I'm ancient now I guess 22 years later but with the turning of a new year you always have these prognosticators that are always making these predictions and typically they'll publish them in a newspaper or on the internet or magazines and I find it amusing because they they quote the same people who've made predictions in years past and they were wrong every time why in the world would they think that these people would be right all of a sudden I mean, come on, they've never gotten these things right. Now, some of them are smart enough that they make such generalized predictions that eventually something's going to happen that would be remotely like that. And of course, then they can claim credit for having predicted it. But you know, we Christians sometimes and our, we Christian conservatives are also vulnerable because we are also at times enamored by people who claim to be able to predict things. Got a lot of people who are always, uh, who walk around making prophecies. They're, they're, they're going to prophesy this, they're going to prophesy that. And yet, most of the time, those prophecies never happen. Now, I'm not talking about reading prophecy out of Scripture. I'm talking about people who prophesy certain things within the Christian community. They write a new book every now and then, so you'll read their new prophecies, hoping that you've forgotten the fact that most of the prophecies they made previously in their previous bestseller haven't come true. We should not be vulnerable to that kind of thing. 
You should not be open to all these conspiracy theories, all of these wild, outlandish, everywhere I go, and Paul can tell you the same happens to him, we are always having people come up to us and say, well, what do you think about this? Man, what do you think about that? I had a guy come to me a few weeks ago when I was in McAllister, and he said, what do you think about the fact that uh, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi are being rumored to be Jesuits? I said, yes, and they're from Golob or somewhere else too, another planet. So I said, come on, man. You don't have to be uh, trying to dig up stuff about them being Jesuits. They knew of, do enough bad stuff right there on the surface that you can call them wicked ministers of Satan. You don't, you don't have to call them Jesuits or whatever. But, you know, we are vulnerable to this kind of stuff. I mean, I had people for, for months telling me about QAnon and how all this stuff's going to happen and, and this was all a big sting operation and that before you knew it, in just a few days, there's going to be all these arrests and all these bad suckers are going to have to face. Well, first of all, I wish that had been true. I wish there were going to be all these arrests and these, all these criminals that did all this fraud. And all that. But guys, not a, one of those things happened. Stay away from that stuff. All it does is damage our credibility. And so I told that guy in McAllister, I said, look, I appreciate what you're saying here, but man, I think it destroys our credibility when we get up and we say stuff like that, and then it either turns out that it's not true or it never turns out to be true. And we, then when we talk about things that are true, people don't listen to us because we've been pushing stuff that isn't true. Stay away from all of these conspiracy theories and all of these modern day prophets that have all these inside tracks. Because I'm telling you guys, typically speaking, they don't. In fact, I was talking with a good friend who's a, a, a very committed Christian. And I was talking to him about this very thing. He said, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think we probably have modern day prophets. And I said, well, uh, if we do they would be held to the same standard that God has always held prophets to. And he said, well, yeah, well, yeah that's the Old Testament. I said, well, why would God hold a prophet to 100% accuracy? Why, why would he do that in the Old Testament? Well, it's because he presumes to speak for God, right? Well, how often is God wrong? If he ever was wrong, what would he cease to be? Yeah, he wouldn't be God in the first place, right? So the reason why God said in the Old Testament, my prophets are always right, and if they're wrong, they're not my prophet, is because God would never give faulty information. So he said, well, you know, some of these modern-day prophets, I said, well, they're wrong all the time. He said, well, I mean, they're wrong every now and then. I said, well, when do you know they're going to be wrong? How do you know when to trust what they're saying and when not to? Therefore, as critical as it may sound, I pretty much discount most of this stuff. Let me tell you what I stick to. I stick to what God's Word says. And I don't try to twist it, manipulate it, and somehow figure America in to some obscure passage in the book of Ezekiel. I mean, maybe America's in the Bible somewhere because we're, we've become fairly godless as a country. And the Bible does say a lot about what happens to godless people groups. But don't, don't be following these folks that are always trying to uncover some hidden knowledge. If God wants you to know, he'll put it in his word. He won't hide it. And you won't have to have some person that has to read the tea leaves and they're wrong about half the time. Because then the problem is you never know when they're right. God's always right. Well, that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about vision. Well, what in the world are you talking about then, Dan, if you're not talking about that kind of vision... I'm talking about the kind of vision that every believer ought to have where we seek and sense and then follow the direction laid out for us by God in His Word where we are spiritually sensitive and where we are, are, are spiritually perceptive to the world around us and to what God is doing. You know, the Bible constantly tells us to be on the look for what he's doing in our lives. In fact, God even says, be sure to make your election and your calling certain. Now see, when we talk about callings, what do we normally think about? Come on. When we think about callings, what do we normally think about? Preachers. Preachers are the guys that are called. Where in Scripture does it say that preachers are the only ones that get a calling from God? Well, it doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, what it says generically is that every Christian ought to make certain that they know what their calling is. 
You have a calling from God. Every born again believer has a calling from God and preaching and teaching and doing something with worship are only three of many hundreds of callings and giftings that God gives to his people. And just because you don't have one of those three, maybe you ought to kind of sit down and thank God for that. And then secondly, you ought to recognize that there are many other things that the body of Christ needs that he has gifted you to do some of. You have a calling. Now here's my question. Do you have the vision to know what that calling is? And do you have the vision to be looking for opportunities to engage that calling to make an eternal difference in the world you live in? That's the real question. You may or may not like Henry David Thoreau, and I, I don't care much for him myself as a person, but he wrote something that's right, and I want you to listen to what he said. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Yep. Now I'll let, you let that sink in for just a moment. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Now I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but here's what I'm going to take it to mean. There are many of us that look at life, but we don't see it. We look at people, but we don't see them. We look at the things of God, but we don't see them. We look at our callings and opportunities, but we don't see them. Let me illustrate. This is a grainy picture in just a second. You're going to see why. Obviously, this pickup has run off the road. Uh, hopefully no one was severely injured or killed. There's some uh, bystanders standing over the pickup. Obviously is off to the left. They've run off the road for some reason. But we've all seen something like that, right? But there's the actual picture. The picture that I showed you to scale is to the left. That's where that pickup actually is sitting. Now when you saw that first picture on the left, you didn't know that, did you? So that's just a pickup that's run off the road. But when you look at this, now you have the whole story. <laughs> I think that might illustrate what it means to look at something and then to see something. Now I see. We even say that, don't we? Oh, 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 now I see. What do we mean by that? Oh, now I understand. So my question to you is, do you understand the value of spiritual insight? The value of spiritual vision? Are you a person of vision? If you're a believer, you ought to be. For that matter, even if you're not a believer, but you're a business person, you ought to be a person of vision. It's people of vision who get things done. But in the kingdom of God, it takes on an even greater weight of importance because we're not just handling dollars and cents here in somebody's future and investments. We're handling the kingdom of God in our hands. We're handling the king of, kingdom of God in our lives. And one day, we'll give an account for what we do with that kingdom. So let me begin by translating this concept of vision into a spiritual message. In the book of Mark, chapter 7, there's a story told of one of the episodes where Jesus feeds a large multitude with very little food. There's a couple of these instances in Scripture. One is a group of 5,000 men and then all the women and children. This group in Mark is a group that numbers about 4,000 men and then the women and the children. Well, the disciples find out that they've got a little bit of bread and a few fish, just like in the other example, because those were common uh, edibles in those days. People tended to travel with some of that to eat, but they couldn't round up enough to feed over 4,000 people. Well, Jesus works a miracle, which is no big deal for him, and he makes this food sufficient to the point that when they're finished, there's leftovers, and everybody is full. Now, I believe Jesus worked this miracle for a couple of reasons. One, those people needed something to eat, but there's something more. Jesus is setting up the disciples for a lesson because right after this, in Mark chapter 8, he sends these guys on ahead and he tells them, he says, now listen, be wary of the leaven of the Pharisees. Well, these disciples immediately start saying, what, what is he talking about? Are we, are we going somewhere else where we're not going to have enough bread? Are we going to have to gather up some more food? Do, 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 do we, is he going to have to work into the miracle? Well, they knew that throughout Scripture, leaven is often used as a symbol for sin. 
This is why three days before Passover, the Jews were commanded to get all the leaven out of their houses. They wanted all representations of sin to be removed, God said, so you can celebrate without sin. This is why Jesus was sinless without leaven, because it takes a perfect sacrifice to satisfy a holy God. Well, Jesus is setting these guys up. And obviously when he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, what he's talking about is their teachings. But these disciples are so thick-headed, they're such doofuses, that they still think he's talking about bread. And they're scratching their heads. Wait, wait, do, do we need to go buy more bread? And finally, Jesus just kind of rips into them. And he says, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? I've told you these things. Why would you be worried, first of all, about the bread quantity? Because you just saw just a little bit ago that it doesn't matter. If there's just a little bit, it's going to be enough. I certainly couldn't have been referring to that. Can't you guys get it into your thick heads that we're doing something spiritual here? I wonder how many times God says that to us 2,000 years later. Can't you guys get it? We're doing something spiritual here. Because you see, we're always looking at the outside. We look, but we don't see. We don't see what he's doing. We've forgotten what he has done in the past. So the next time we come across something that is as challenging, we throw our hands up in the air, typically start screaming, begging God to save us before we die. And we've forgotten everything he's done in the past. But there's something more here. And I believe what is here is that God is trying to tell us we must see deeper than what we look at. And we must stop looking at the things of God and start seeing the things of God. So now let's make that personal. You have a calling from God. We've not spent a lot of time proving that to you today, but if you trust me at all, trust me, the Bible says you have a calling from God. How much time have you spent seeing that calling? Instead of just looking at it. Kind of, you know, well, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, now let's get back to business. No, that is your business. You remember the Scrooge when, when uh, Ebenezer says, we had a business together, Marley. And Marley says, mankind was our business. Yeah, I see that. Now let's get back to business. No, 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 no. We're missing it. That's not the business. This is the business. The calling that God has placed on your life. What about this church, Fairview? I guarantee you God has a work for this church. Now I'm not suggesting we haven't been doing some of that. But going forward in 2022, what does God have? What does God have for you in 2022? Are you going to approach it the same way you did 2021? Will you see it or will you just look at it? So let me give another illustration. Many of you know that I lead tours to places like Gettysburg. Been there many, many times. Gettysburg was a significant battle in the war between the states. It happened on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863 in a little town in southern Pennsylvania. By the time that battle was over, some 58,000 casualties had been racked up. Not all of them killed outright. About eight to 9,000 bodies on the field. In a couple of weeks to three, there'd be twice that many that died from wounds. It's a terrible, terrible thing. These are some of the dead at Gettysburg. At Gettysburg, there's an interesting thing that developed on the battlefield. The Union Army, represented by this blue mark, was kind of in the shape of a fish hook. You say, well, what does that have to do with something spiritual? It will in just a moment, I promise you. But you have to understand the history. So the Union Army is like a fish hook. The Confederate Army, the Southern Army, is to the left along what is called Seminary Ridge. And you can see the Union Army there in blue. At both ends of that line were hills, prominent rises in terrain that the Union Army held and had to hold or they would have lost that battle. Today we have modern warfare, modern weaponry. Terrain is not as critical, but I guarantee you, you talk to anybody in the military, it's always best to have the high ground. Because that way your enemy has to come uphill to attack you. 
It's just always better. And if the war becomes more conventional, it's even that much more important. So on the right end of the Union line, there were two hills, Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill that you can see in that photograph. Way down on the southern end of that line, there was another hill. It's called Little Round Top. If you've done any reading of Gettysburg at all, you already are recognizing names. And you say, well, what's so important about that in that battle? Well, it's, it's what two men did in respect to both of those places that I want to use as an illustration. A southern general by the name of Richard Ewell on day one of Gettysburg, so this has been July the 1st, 63, had fought all day long and finally fought his way to Culp's Hill, but not up on it. He's at the foot of it, and he's off to the, what would, in this photograph, off to the left of Cemetery Hill. The Union soldiers are on those two hills, but very thinly reinforced. Richard Ewell had received a message from General Lee that said, Take those hills above the town if practicable. Now we can argue all day long and, and Civil War buffs and Gettysburg buffs argue back and forth as to whether or not Richard Ewell was negligent, whether he should have taken those hills. Stonewall Jackson would have taken those hills. I don't know what would have happened. When we start speculating as to what could have, would have happened, who knows? But we know this. He decided that it was not practicable and he didn't take those two hills. During the night of July the 1st, the Union Army did what the Southern Army would have done if they'd been on those hills. They reinforced. They dug trenches. They piled up rocks and logs so that by the morning of July the 2nd, those hills are now a stronghold. And for the next two days, July the 2nd and 3rd, thousands of Confederate soldiers would die trying to take those hills and thousands of Union soldiers would die trying to hold them. And in the end, the Union held those hills because Richard Ewell, apparently, we don't know, didn't see the importance of moving on day one and spent two more days and thousands of lives trying to do what he probably could have done, maybe should have done on day one. Now let's go to the southern end of the field. There's that other hill, a little round top. Amazingly, on the morning of July the 2nd, even though Culp's Hill up there on the right that we just talked about is now fortified, this hill on the far left of the Union line is not. Now you remember in warfare, if you can flank your enemy, that means get around them, you, you can get behind them and beat them. So being flanked is a major deal. By the way, that's a major deal today. It's a major deal in football. If you can get around the end, if you know anything about football, you flank your enemy, right? Or if you're defense and you can get around the end, get to the quarterback, you flanked your enemy. It's the same thing on the battlefield. This hill is unoccupied. And so this Union commander, this is Union commander now, General Governor Warren goes up on that hill and he stands there and he looks and he sees that the Southern Army off to his left is about to attack and there's nobody up here. They're going to hold the high ground. So he runs off trying to find pieces of other units, and he puts together this piecemeal defense of Little Round Top. And if you know anything about Joshua Chamberlain, if you've watched the movie Gettysburg, all this, there were her heroic things done on both sides. It was equally heroic. But in the end, when day two is over, July the 2nd, the Union holds Little Round Top. Now they have the high ground on both ends. And ultimately... Gettysburg turns out to be a terrible loss for the South and probably is the beginning of the end of the war between the states. Today, there's a statue of Warren, as you can see, standing on the very rock where he stood looking at where the Confederates were about to charge from to come up that hill. I actually have a canteen. I meant to bring it here today, and I just walked off without it. I have a canteen of a soldier from the 5th Texas Regiment who charged up that very hill that, that he's standing at the top of uh, carrying this wooden canteen and was wounded in trying to charge up that hill. Now you say, well, Dan, thank you so much for the little lesson on Gettysburg, but I didn't come here for a history lesson. Well, I think it's a lesson in vision. Because if you take these two commanders, they acted very differently and paid the consequences. The general on the left, Richard Ewell, for some reason did not see the need to give it all to take Culp's and cemetery hills, and because of it, they were never able to take them. The commander on the right, General Warren, saw 
the value of Little Round Top and saved at least the Union Army at Gettysburg because he acted accordingly. Vision, or the lack thereof, plays a vital role in the lives of those who are able to fulfill God's calling in their lives. There is a spiritual application here. Throughout Scripture, you find where God gave men visions. Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, and then that's when he hears the voice and he says, Lord, here I am, send me. Paul is constantly receiving visions from the Lord. Now, I realize that that's not necessarily the way God communicates in our day. But you go through the book of Acts and you'll find where Paul is constantly responding. And not just Paul, Peter, even unsaved people like a Gentile, a non-Jew named Cornelius. He's responding to visions. Well, if he hadn't been a person or if they hadn't been people of vision, would they have seen the importance? Would they have acted accordingly? Would world history be different? If you go to the book of 1 Samuel, way back in the Old Testament... In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, when Samuel was just a boy and God was calling him to the ministry, notice what the Bible says times were like in those days. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now, when it says the word of the Lord was precious, here's what that means. It's like when there's a drought and water is precious, meaning there's little of it. And he goes on to clarify there was no open vision. Now listen to what scripture is saying. In the days that prophet Samuel was raised up by God, who became a massive spiritual influence, there was no vision. The word of God was almost non-existent, was precious like in a drought. Or what about this verse that you've all read, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision or revelation, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. Regardless of what translation you read, the clear message is if we don't have an operating understanding of what God has said, we're going to cast off what God has said and do what we think. Even if it isn't sinful. Understand, just because you're not doing something sinful doesn't mean it isn't a sin. As we define sinful. See, the Bible talks about two kinds of sins. Bad things that we do that we shouldn't. Those are called sins of commission. But then the Bible also talks about good things that we ought to do that we don't. Those are sins of omission. I omitted to do this. Well, I'm going to have to give an account for both of those. And so understand how important vision is to the overall work that God wants to do in you. So three things and then we're done. Number one, opportunities must be seen before they can be exploited. Well, that's true in the business world, whether you're a Christian or not. That's true in the sports world, whether you're a Christian or not. But it's even doubly more so in the spiritual world because we're up against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. We're fighting hell itself for the souls of men and women in the advance of God's kingdom, which will ultimately, of course, advance because God will see to it. But he's chosen to use us. But you will not exploit things you don't see. You will not take advantage of opportunities you don't notice. And I contend that many of us look right at life and we don't see it. We look right at things and we don't see them because we don't understand the value of vision. I've used this quote before, but Helen Keller was once asked. You remember, she's the one that's born both blind and deaf. She was asked, can you imagine a thing worse than being blind? She said, oh, of course. Worse than being blind is to have sight and no vision. To be able to see, but you can't see. You blunder through life not knowing, not having a plan, not understanding who you are without real purpose. This is John Scully. I don't know if Scully's even a Christian. Probably chances are he's not. But he made Pepsi-Cola a household word. And then he went over to work for Apple when they were just a seed and not even an apple yet. And they became the conglomerate there. Listen to what he says. The future belongs to those who see possibilities before they become obvious. How many of you could make a really great investment once you find out what a great investment it was? Well, I can make those investments every day. I'm really good at predicting what's already happened. I'm really great at inventing things that have already been invented. You see, the one who is able to really get in there and make a difference is the one who sees things before it's obvious to most others. And I'm not just talking about investments. That'll work. 
But I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. God working through you. God working through me. Or here's the Christian pollster, Barna. How many of us haven't read some Barna study? George Barna, Paul and I know him. He's a great Christian man. Listen to what he says. Vision becomes a bold reason for living. It is a badge of purpose that the bearer wears proudly and courageously. Vision is not vision if it's not inspiring. So I want to ask you, are you a person of vision? If you are, then you're an inspiring individual. Are you? I don't mean that you have this flamboyant personality. You may not. But you can have a dull personality, but be a person of vision and be inspiring. Some of the greatest people in history had awful personalities. They were terrible. But they were inspiring. It's because they could see and didn't just look. They understood the value of vision. Now remember again, I'm talking about spiritual things here. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So understand, we're talking about a spiritual thing here. So, to be able to exploit opportunities that God may put into our pathways, we're going to have to be able to see. If we don't see them, we won't exploit them. And I would submit to you that the majority of us kind of blunder through life not seeing things. It's because we don't intentionally see. We just look. We blow right past people because we're just looking. We don't see. Do you ever see a person in church who's got tears running down their face? You ought to immediately say, man, I need to pray for them. Maybe discreetly you walk up to them after the service. Well, you know them or not, that's immaterial. And you just put your arm around me and say, hey, listen, I don't have to know all the details. If you want to share, that's fine. But I saw you crying. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Do you have any idea how that may turn that person's day, week, month, year around? Number two, taking life as it comes is not a wise approach. That's kind of a duh statement, isn't it? I mean, everything matters. Scripture says that a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground that God doesn't know about. You don't have a hair on your head that God hadn't counted. And then he says, and don't worry because you're worth a lot more than a sparrow. Meaning, I know a lot more about you than I do the sparrows. And I know every time one of them hits the ground. God knows about you. You matter to him. But do you embrace that? Or are you just one of the throng? You're just one of the masses and you just see yourself as being herded along. So you just kind of get through one day to the next, one week to the next, one month to the next. Now I realize we can't all pick our places in life and our, our positions. But I'm not talking about all of that. I'm not talking about what you have in the bank. I'm not talking about the kind of car you drive, the kind of house you live in. I'm talking about God working in you. And there is no depression in that. God is rich to you. And he wants to use you. He's used some of the poorest, most meager people in history. I mean, just think of what the poorest, most unknown people in history have pulled off. I was reading just the other day. I should have thrown it here on a slide. I started to and then didn't. Um, uh, who was the um, um, uh, track runner from Oklahoma? That uh, Jim Thorpe. Did you know the day that he won all those gold medals and silver medals? He woke up that morning and found out that someone had stolen his running shoes. I didn't know that. I read that story this week. Someone had stolen his running shoes. And if you look at that very famous picture of him standing there at the Olympics, if you look down at his feet, he's wearing two different shoes. He had borrowed a shoe from two different people. They didn't even match and they didn't fit. They were too big. And he won gold medals and silver medals running in shoes that weren't his, that didn't match and didn't fit. Don't tell me about your disadvantages. Johnny Erickson Tata is a quadriplegic from a diving accident, and she has touched the world for Christ. Psalm 37, 23. I've got to move on very quickly here. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. You can take that both ways. God is ordering your steps, but the other way you can take it is God cares about your steps. He cares where you walk. 
Or how about Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Don't just blunder through life. Have a purpose. C.T. Studd was a missionary. He's a British missionary. And he wrote a, um, a poem called um, Only One Life. Many of you have heard the, the key line from it. Here it is. Only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That, that refrains through that poem over and over and over. I've quoted that for years. He is right. It doesn't mean that your job doesn't matter or making your house payment doesn't matter or, or you know, mowing your yard doesn't matter. But in the end, those things really don't matter. What matters is what you've done with what God gave you and what he called you to do. Are you doing that? And then the third thing, and I'm done. We will give an account to God for missed opportunities. Now, you won't give an account to God for opportunities that didn't come your way. But you will give an account, and I will give an account for opportunities that came my way that I passed, that I didn't see because I was just looking at life. I didn't have vision. And I'm going to give an account for that. Well, that's a terrible, sobering thought, isn't it? That we're going to give an account for what we don't do. Soon one's life will be passed. Only the things done for Christ will last. When I first came here, there was a man in this church, some of you know him, a wonderful guy named Mike Hogg. Mike was nearing retirement, good guy, had helped to lead the worship here from time to time. But finally confessed, and it was all happening about the time that I came. So I really didn't know Mike, but I got to know him real fast. He, uh, he finally confessed to the congregation that God had called him to preach many years ago when he was a younger man, and he had never done it. And at retirement age, Mike said, I'm going to do what God called me to do. And he surrendered to the ministry, and today is working on a church start on the other side of Edmond where he's preaching today. I got to be a part of his ordination service. I got to know Mike real quickly. And I've always been struck, and I've told him this, and I'm amazed. Because most people at that time in their lives don't make major decisions. They don't make major shifts and changes. They're set, and that's what they're going to be. But he realized that there are some things that matter more, and I'm going to have to give an account to God if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. Now, your calling is different from his. But remember what James says in James 4, 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 10, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. As we have opportunity. So here in closing, I want to ask you this question. How can you make the most of this new year? Because we're staring right down the barrel of a whole year. Now, if you approach 2022 like you approach 2021, you're going to get the same results. I mean, you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting, right? So you do this year like you did last year. Don't be surprised when you get to the end of this year, you find out it turned out just like last year. Because you're doing the same stuff. Now, all of these could be a whole sermon in and of themselves very quickly, and then we'll close. I would suggest that you start by reassessing God's purpose for your life. I don't care what age you are. You may be my cog nearing retirement. Doesn't matter. You need to sit down and reassess what God wants you to be. What God wants you to do. You, you say, well, I, I'm, it's too late. No, it's not too late for you. It is never too late to do the right thing. Reassess. Am I fulfilling what God has called me to do. Second thing that I would suggest that you do, make an honest assessment of last year. Don't lie to yourself. I mean, that's an idiot that would do that. Don't lie to yourself. Be honest about last year. Were you faithful last year? Now, we were all faithful sometimes and not faithful sometimes. I get that. But I mean, were you faithful to your calling? Were you faithful to God's purpose in your life? Or did you kind of set it aside, cast off restraint because there was no vision and you did something else? Reassess last year. Number three, prayerfully set specific goals for 2022, which there's a whole process for that. But write down, write down on paper what it is God has called you to do, what it is that God has gifted you to do. What are your passions? 
Where does your life lead you in the area of giftedness and passion and want to and drive? Well, those are good indicators of what God has called you to do. Write down goals and then begin taking action now. Now, a warning about these goals from my old mentor, Adrian Rogers. If our goals are not from God and according to His will, even our success will be failure. Think that through. I can be really successful in the way the world defines success and be a total failure in the way heaven defines success. You must be successful at what God has called you to do. And if you're faithful, that's success in God's book. God never promises that we'll win the world. God never promises that I'll pastor the largest church in America. That's not the definition of success. The definition of success is my finding out what God has called me to do and do it with everything I have. And not look at life, but see it. It's a difference. So I want you to imagine with me for just a moment. This is the last thing and we're going to pray. I want you to just imagine with me for a moment. There's a quote here by a French author and poet. I want you to listen to what he wrote. If you want to build a ship, don't herd people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. What do you think people who long to be on the ocean will eventually do? They'll find them a ship. They'll either buy one or they'll build one, but they'll find them a ship. You see, the reason why you and I don't find the means or the opportunity to do what we know God's called us to do is because we don't long for it. We do what we want to do. You're doing what you want to do. Now, I realize there's illness and other things that we can't control, but even in the midst of that, we still do what we want to do. So rather than getting people to build ships, if you want them to do that, get them to fall in love with the ocean. They'll build ships. Maybe you and I just need to fall in love again with what God wants us to be and who He is. How about that? We'll find the motivation. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you now at the end of this message. Lord, this is your word. God, I must admit to you that I've not always been the man of vision that I ought to be, but I want to be. I've tried to be a pastor of vision over all the years that I've pastored. Sometimes we saw those visions come to reality. Other times we struggled and we, we skipped and we stumbled, but we were faithful in the attempt. Well, that's, that's all you ask. You don't ask us to produce in a way that the world defines as a success. You ask us to be faithful. Lord, every person listening to me today, whether they're in this building or they're listening online or they'll listen later to this recording, every person here has been called to do something. And not just one little something. I mean a, a pursuit in life. Yeah, we have careers and we have jobs and all that. And, and that can be our calling. But we need to make certain that is our calling. Because even if we're successful, but it wasn't successful in what God called us to be, our success is failure. We want to be people that value vision. We want to be men and women. We want to be a church of vision. We have a new year to kind of hit the reset button. I pray, God, that we'll do just that. I pray that you'll take these words, drive them into our heads and into our hearts. Help us to walk away from here with more vision. Help us to walk away as people who don't just look, but we see. Lord, I pray all of these things in Jesus' incredible name. Amen.